Hello, everyone, and a warm welcome to today's edition of Patchcast. Today is Tuesday, September 15, 2020. I'm Rifat Mannan in Philadelphia, and I am remotely joined by my good friend Emilio Madrigal, who is in Boston right now. Today, we are very delighted to welcome Dr. Jennifer Bennett, who is an assistant professor of pathology at the University of Chicago. She will deliver the sixth lecture in the ZYN pathology lecture series. The title of her talk is The Jabras of Uterine Mesenchymal Neoplasms. As always, please feel free to post your questions or comments on YouTube and Facebook chat windows, and Dr. Bennett will answer them towards the end of the session. Thank you, Dr. Bennett, for joining us today. We are delighted to have you. Over to you now. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I wanted to thank Carlos and Fabiola for inviting me to speak in this session and also to Rafat and uh, Emilio for helping with ev organize everything. So today I'm going to discuss the zebras of uterine mesenchymal neoplasm, or those oddballs that you don't see in everyday um, practice. So the question is, why should we try to classify these zebras? Well, many mesenchymal neoplasms fail to respond to conventional chemo or radiation therapy regimens. Thus, targeted therapy may be an alternative treatment modality in treating these tumors. Examples of targeted therapy include tyrosine kinase inhibitors in inflammatory myofibroblastic tumors, mTOR inhibitors in picomas, NTREC inhibitors and NTREC rearranged spindle cell sarcomas, and EZH2 inhibitors, which are currently in clinical trials for SMARC A4 deficient uterine sarcoma. First of all, what we need to decide is when you get the challenging uterine mesenchymal neoplasm is what molecular test do we order? If you're looking for a mutation, such as a TSC mutation in PCOMA, or smark a 4 mutation in smark a 4 deficient uterine sarcoma, you want to order a next-generation sequencing panel, which evaluates DNA. However, if you're looking for rearrangements, such as ALK fusion in inflammatory myofibroblastic tumors, or NTREC fusions in NTREC sarcomas, you want to use a next-generation sequencing RNA panel that looks at fusions, or FISH. So starting off, we'll discuss perivascular epithelioid cell tumor, or PCOMA. So PCOMAs occur around an average age of 50 years, uh, and grossly, they can resemble smooth muscle tumors of the uterus. And a lot of times, that's what they clinically are thought to be. So on gross examination, they have a wide uh, appearance. They can be well circumscribed and look like a lyomyoma, or they can be grossly necrotic as seen on the left side of the screen, or you can see focal infiltration as present in the right side of the screen. On low power examination, these tumors often grow in nests, and the nests are separated by this very delicate vasculature, which is very easy to see in the two slides I provided, but sometimes it can be very difficult to desert discern, but if you order a vascular marker such as ERG or um, CD34, it should light right up and it'll help you to find the, nest, the nested growth of these tumors. They can also grow in sheets or alveoli or cords as well, but the nested growth is the most common. Historically, these tumors are believed to arise from the periepithelioid cell that surrounds the blood vessels. However, the, the benign uh, version of these cells has never been identified. So you can see this radial or perivascular distribution of the tumor cells emanating from the blood vessel in a large amount of picomas, but it is not pathognomonic for the lesion as you can also see it in other tumors, such as smooth muscle tumors of the uterus. On high power examination, these tumors are comprised primarily of epithelioid cells with clear and granular or eosinophilic cytoplasm. 
You can also see intranuclear inclusions on occasion. Atypia varies from mild to marked, and mitoses vary as well. A subset of the tumor is also show a single cell growth. Normally this, pat this growth pattern is not the sole uh, growth of AP coma. So if you see only spindle cell growth, you want to be able, you want to make sure you're evaluated immunohistochemically and molecularly to ensure you're not dealing with another type of uterine sarcoma. Other features you may see in a subset of picomas include foamy, foamy appearance to the cytoplasm as well as melanin pigment. And most picomas show some degree of stromal sclerosis. However, when it's extensive, it can be designated as a sclerosing picoma. These are most common in the retroperitoneum, but can also be seen on occasion in the uterus. So picomas may show a number of atypical histologic features, including marked nuclear atypia as seen on both sides of the screen. You can have these giant cells, um, you can also have ma uh, melanoma-like macronucleoli, as well as tumor cell necrosis. Of um, note, you might see benign appearing foreign body giant cells, and those should not be misconstrued as an atypical feature. So several algorithms have been derived to predict the behavior of these tumors. The first was by Fulpe and colleagues in 2005, and they evaluated a group of soft tissue uh, picomas as well as GYM picomas and split them into three different categories based on the number of atypical features that were present. Nine years later, Schoolmeister and colleagues you, uh, looked at a series of 16 GYM picomas and reclassified them into benign or uncertain malignant potential or malignant based on the presence or the number of atypical features noted. And a few years later, we actually decided to get rid of the benign category because we had one picoma in our series of 32 tumors that the only atypical feature was the size slightly greater than five centimeters and it still recurred. So we, with that, we thought that all picomas should be designated as uncertain malignant potential since we actually don't know, um, just based on basic morphology, whether or not they will recur. We also decided to lower the threshold to designate something as malignant to greater than or equal to three features, which accurately classified all of our malignant picomas, except for that one that was had an increased size and still recurred. And the WHO fifth edition that was just released this past week or last week, uses the FOLPI and the, and the Bennett criteria in the classification for PCOMAs. So the issue with PCOMAs is they're characterized by expression of myo, myomelanocytic markers. Myogenic markers include SMA, Desmond, and Caldesmond, and melanocytic include HMB45, MELANA, and MIDAF. But exactly how much staining for melan melanocytic markers is required to make the diagnosis of PCOMAs remains controversial, as a subset of uterine smooth muscle tumors may also express uh, melanocytic markers. And some groups actually believe that PCOMAs are just a subgroup of smooth muscle tumors that show melanocytic mark uh, differentiation. Molecularly, there are two main groups of picomas. You have your classic picomas, which are characterized by TSC1 or TSC2 mutations. And these mutations can be somatic or germline. When they're germline, they're indicative of tuberous sclerosis complex. And this is seen in approximately 10% of uterine picomas. The other group is TFE3 translocation associated picomas and these are characterized by TFE3 fusions. So for the classic picomas, in a normal person, um, TSC1 and TSC2 are tumor suppressors that uh, merge to form a 
heterodimer. They act to inhibit REB, which is a GTP binding protein. When GTP is not bound, REB inhibits mTOR, which is the kinase that leads to cell proliferation and growth. However, when a mutation is present in either one of the genes, the heterodimer can't form and the REB protein is no longer inhibited, GTP can bind, which leads to activation of the mTOR kinase and thus cell proliferation and growth. So there has been a lot of interest in um, using mTOR inhibitors as a possible therapy in these patients. This one group out of Italy, they first looked at the role of chemotherapy, VEGFR inhibitors, and mTOR inhibitors in advanced stage picomas. This included both picomas of the uterus as well as extra uterine picomas. They did a retrospective study and found that only about, or actually less than 20% of patients responded to the standard chemotherapy regimen, which was soft tissue sarcoma chemotherapy. But um, about 40% of patients responded to the mTOR inhibitors. Unfortunately, though, the patients with uterine picomas had less of a response than those with extra uterine picomas. And then the following year, this was in 2019, they um, added anti, they did a prospective study and added anti-estrogen treatment to these patients with malignant picomas that were resistant to their mTOR inhibitors. And it's been shown that there is a close interaction between the mTOR and estrogen receptor pathways, even if the PCOMA does not express ER and PR by IHC. Using uh, the anti-estrogen treatment in combination with the mTOR inhibitor, they found that they achieved reversion of resistance in 86% of their patients and had a long-lasting response in 45%. So definitely good news, and hopefully we'll continue to hear um, uh, advances in PCOMA um, therapy in the future. So moving on to TFE3 translocation-associated PCOMAs. These PCOMAs are characterized by nested or alveolar architecture, although solid forms or solid sheets may be occasionally seen. The cells are typically clear um, and they have variable amounts of atypia and mitoses. They strongly and diffusely express TFE3. However, it's always important to um, do the confirmatory uh, FISH test or RNA fusion analysis if you want to ensure you do have a TFE3 translocation PCOMA. In addition, these PCOMAs tend to be strongly and diffusely positive for HMB45 and cathepsin K and only show focal to negative expression for melan-A and myogenic markers. So moving back to the myomelanocytic controversy. Um, this is a hot topic in GYM pathology. And in 2014, Schoolmeister and colleagues in their um, report of 16 GYM PCOMAs proposed that a tumor that morphologically looked like a PCOMA and had at least focal IHC expression of two melanocytic markers, as well as expression of at least one muscle marker, should be classified as a PCOMA. However, there was an article just released last week in Pressed AJSP by the MSK group that they had a series of uterine mesenchymal tumors with myomelanocytic differentiation. They expressed at least one, if not more, uh, melanocytic and my, uh, myogenic markers, and only five out of 17 of the tumors harbored a TFC2 mutation, and one out of 12 had a TFE3 rearrangement. This is a table from their study, and I've highlighted the ones that fulfill the Schoolmeister criteria showing expression, of, at least focal expression of two melanocytic markers, and they all had expression of at least one myogenic marker, and none of these harbored mutations in TSC2, or sorry, TS in either of the TSC genes. So it kind of leads us into a conundrum, what do we do in these cases? 
they had uh, proposed an algorithm for um, how to diagnose whether it's leiomyosarcoma, picoma, endometrial stromal sarcoma, or sarcoma NOS. But of course, this is all um, um, an evolving subject at the moment. So definitely, we need more work into these to really determine the histogenesis of these picomas and whether they are actually distinct from uh, smooth muscle tumors. But ultimately, what we need to do whenever we encounter a uterine mesenchymal tumor that has myomelanocytic differentiation is you want to make sure you generously sample the specimen and perform a thorough morphological and immunohistochemical evaluation. If you can't make a definitive diagnosis, you can always sign it out descriptively and in the comments discuss the differential, discuss why we can't make a uh, definitive diagnosis, and especially with all the um, conundrums in GYM pathology in this topic right now, and recommend genetic testing for clinically indicated cases. The main thing, the bottom line that we, is we do not want to miss a potential tuber sclerosis diagnosis or the opportunity for treatment with mTOR inhibitors. So that's what we definitely want to make sure to emphasize to the clinical team. Moving on to inflammatory myofibroblastic tumors. So IMTs were first described in the uterus by the uh, Vancouver group in 1987, where they were called inflammatory pseudotumor of the uterus. This terminology is no longer recommended, but the group described two tumors, one in a six-year-old patient and the other in a 30-year-old woman. And they both had, I think, at least four years of follow-up and had an uneventful clinical course. Over the next 18 years, there were a few scattered case reports of uterine IMTs, but it wasn't until 2005 where the UCSF group described a series of six inflammatory myofibroblastic tumors of that uterus, all of which were ALK positive and had a benign clinical course. So at that time, they naturally suggested that IMTs of the uterus are benign. Fast forward a few years, and then reports started emerging of aggressive IMTs and basically has become a hot, a hot topic of GYM pathology nowadays to distinguish between a benign and a malignant IMT. So IMTs tend to occur in patients in their late 30s, early 40s, and grossly they too can resemble a leiomyoma or leiomyosarcoma. Um, a lot of times, once again, they're clinically uh, suspected to be a smooth muscle tumor, and they may be received morselated, and sometimes you can see a myxoid or glistening appearance suggestive of the myxoid matrix in these tumors. Other times, they can appear grossly necrotic. There are three patterns uh, for IMTs. The first is the myxoid pattern, which is characterized by a by hypocellularity and abundant myxoid matrix. You can see here the spindle cells growing in this myxoid stroma. Other times, the tumor resembles a, a nodular fasciitis and can also sometimes just consist of myxoid pools. The compact or fascicular pattern resembles a smooth muscle tumor and can have a story form or fascicular growth pattern. It's more hypercellular and you may see a little bit of myxoid matrix, but not nearly as much as what you would see in the myxoid pattern. And then finally, the hyalinized pattern is quite rare. And if present, it typically only comprises a small proportion of the tumor. Uh, histologically, it resembles a scar, as you can see on the right side of the screen. Um, so these tumors, of course, are characterized by lymphoplasmocytic inflammation. However, the amount of, of lymphoplasmocytic inflammation varies between tumors, and you can also see other types of inflammatory cells, including eosinophils, neutrophils, and um, even Teuton-type giant cells. In a small proportion of tumors, you can see epithelioid cells that histologically re re resemble 
ganglion-like cells. These should not be misconstrued as a, typ as a feature of ty atypicality um, because they're actually just a different appearance to the benign appearing spindle cells. So in the uterus, the majority of these tumors are positive for alkaminohistochemistry. They show a cytoplasmic granular staining and may or may not have this perinuclear accentuation. Um, the amount and intensity of staining varies depending on the tumor, of course, and also on the, uh, the antibody clone that is used. These tumors may also be uh, positive for a variety of smooth muscle markers as well as CD10. This, this, uh, this is um, a table showing all the major PCOMA studies in the literature. And as you can see, the majority show some degree of positivity for SMA, Desmond, and CD10. However, Cal Desmond is only positive in less than 50% of tumors. The, Intensity and extent of staining also varies um, uh, but, uh, among tumors, and um, it tends to be a little stronger and more um, extensive in the compact or fascicular pattern um, for the uh, myogenic markers. We recently looked at a series of 23 um, uterine inflammatory myofibroblastic tumors for novel IHC markers that have been used in the literature recently. So IFITM1 is a endometrial stromal marker that's supposed to be more sensitive and specific than CD10. And as you can see here, nearly all of our tumors are positive for um, this marker. Similarly, transgelin, which is a smooth muscle tumor, a uh, smooth muscle marker, more touted to be more specific and sensitive than SMA Desmond and Cal Desmond was also positive in nearly all of our tumors. BCOR was actually only weakly positive in 40% of our tumors. And this is important to note since of course in the differential diagnosis with inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor is a BCOR rearranged endometrial stromal sarcoma, and only about 50% of those tumors actually show the strong and diffuse expression of BCOR. So it's um, a pitfall that can happen. If you think, oh, BCOR is negative, it can't be a high-grade ESS. So in most cases, the morphology and ALK positivity can, um, is sufficient to make the diagnosis of IMTs. However, in some cases, it can be quite tricky, and you might want to uh, pursue molecular testing for a definitive diagnosis. So if you use FISH, you use a break-apart probe, which shows a slick signal between the red and green probes. The green probe is the 5' prime end of the partner gene that's used to the 3' prime end of the ALK um, tyrosine kinase uh, domain. As you can see here, it's split or bro uh, broken apart. So it's consistent with the rearrangement. However, in FISH, we have reported abnormal signals um, for a uterine inflammatory myofibroblastic tumors, which I will not go into here, but if you look at any of these references, you can learn more about those signals. And the major pitfall for these tumors it, or for using FISH to uh, make the diagnosis of IMT is you can get a false negative result if an intrachromosomal inversion is present. So if you use RNA fusion analysis instead of FISH, you're able to detect the partner gene. And these are the major studies that have used RNA fusion analysis in their series. And as you can see here, TIMP3 and THBS1 are the main um, partner genes used to um, ALK, and, but several other genes have been identified. However, the pitfall for using RNA sequencing is not all panels sequence the entire ALK gene. So if you have a fusion outside of the exons that are sequenced by your panel, you will result in a false negative. 
or you will get a false negative result. So outside of the GYN tract, only about 50% of IMTs show ALK lesions. However, in the GYN tract, non-ALK lesions are extremely rare, with only one fusion of ETV6, NTREC3, RET, and ROS1 identified. Um, so in pregnancy, IMTs may occur and histologically, they may be very difficult to diagnose because they get this very deciduous appearance to the tumor cells. These tumors have been shown to arise in the setting of prenatal complications, such as gestational hypertension, preeclampsia, and abnormal implantation. They can either be located detached from the placental disc adherent to the placental disc or extra placental membranes are actually within the placental disc. STR analysis has shown that they are of maternal origin and immunohistochemically, aside from what we already dis discussed, they tend to strongly express PR and are weakly positive to negative for ER. They are characterized by TIMP3 and THBS1 fusions which hence is why so many of the ALK fusions uh, reported thus far have partner genes to either TIMP3 and THBS1. And both of these genes are involved in endometrial remodeling and implantation during pregnancy. And these genes are either fused to ALK or else RET in one case or ROS1 in one case. And all IMTs in pregnancy thus far have shown to have a favorable prognosis. So malignant IMTs are, of course, very difficult in some cases to diagnose. It's easy when you have extrauterine disease at diagnosis, or the tumor looks markedly atypical. As you can see, it's hypercellular here. There's brisk mitotic activity and these enormous pleomorphic nuclei with prominent nuclei. Also, you may see lymphovascular invasion or necrosis. However, histologically, but now um, IMTs have also been shown to recur, which is um, a problem spot in GYN pathology. So one review article gave suggestions for when to diagnose a tumor as malignant. Um, their their uh, 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 morphologic features included tumor cell necrosis, large tumor size, moderate to severe atypia, high mitotic activity, and infiltrative borders. But of course, if you have a histologically banal tumor, none of these would apply. In our IHC study, we actually found that we had complete loss of P16 staining in five IMTs, four of which clinically recurred. Um, the fifth one was lost to follow-up, and two of these actually had DNA MGS performed and showed CDKN2 deletion. Similarly, a recent USCAP abstract also showed a recurrent uterine IMT that had a TP53 mutation. So although we do not have a large amount of tumors with these markers performed, and um, uh, it definitely um, is something that needs to be investigated further to see if malignant IMTs are characterized by abnormalities in these genes. So moving on to NCHEG rearranged spindle cell sarcoma or fibrosarcoma-like uterine sarcoma. This is an entity that was diagnosed um, or recently recognized by the MSK group as a result of increased utilization of molecular testing in uterine sarcoma. Historically, these tumors were characterized or sorry, classified as undifferentiated uterine sarcoma Lyomyosarcoma and even endocervical fibroblastic malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor. 
So these tumors that tend to occur in premenopausal females, they're more common in the cervix than the corpus, and most present with stage one disease. Histologically, you see um, fascicles of spindle cells with mild to moderate atypia. The spindle cells have a um, typically have a haphazard distribution and they appear herringbone like, hence giving the terminology fibrosarcoma like. You can at times see this entrapment of these smooth muscle bundles, and the um, cells often have. Um, a lot of eosinophilic cytoplasm. You can also see um, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes in a subset, as well as entrapment of the endocervical or endometrial glands, depending on its location. And some tumors do show um, this uh, degenerative atypia, bizarre type cells. Mitoses are variable throughout. So there have been three main studies and a handful of case reports on these tumors. And the main thing to recognize for immunohistochemistry is that they are consistently negative for Desmond, ER, and PR. So this greatly helps in the um, differential diagnosis with um, leiomyosarcoma, since most leiomyosarcoma just show some degree of positivity for these markers. They are positive for Pantrec, for the Pantrec antibody. However, the amount and intensity of staining is variable. And they have all shown um, staining for S100, which perhaps can be used as a surrogate marker. Two studies did show diffuse staining in the majority of their tumors, whereas one only showed staining in less than 10% of the cells. However, a pitfall exists because you should not use PANTREC IHC in isolation to diagnose these tumors because leiomyosarcomas and normal smooth muscle marker may, or sorry, normal smooth muscle may also be PANTREC positive and lack a fusion, an EDNTREC fusion. So it's important to perform um, fusion analysis to confirm the diagnosis of NTREC sarcoma. So uh, fusions involving both NTREC1 and NTREC3 have been uh, detected, and the fusion partners vary, but the most common one being TPM3. So NTREC stands for neurotrophin tropomyosin receptor kinase, and it encodes these TREC receptors, TREC A, B, and C, and they bind Neurotrophin, uh, neurotrophins such as NGF or nerve growth factor, and through various pathways, it leads to proliferation, survival, angiogenesis, and invasion of the tumor cell. So what's important to note here is that NTREC inhibitors, in particular loritinib, have been used effectively for treatment in TREC fusion positive tumors in both adults and children. So the question arises, what if you have a uterine tumor that morphologically looks like an NTREC sarcoma, but is also S100 negative and PANTREC negative, and you perform molecular testing and it's negative for the NTREC fusion? What do you do now? So what you should do is test for call one a one PDGFB fusion, and if it's positive, it can be it's diagnostic of a call one a one PDGFB rearranged sarcoma, which is just another type of the fibrosarcoma-like uterine sarcoma. These have only been described in one series thus far. The, uh, histologically, they look like NTREC sarcomas, but lack the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. Um, and patients tend to be older. The um, uh, these tumors may actually respond to imidinib immunotherapy, given that they have the call one a one PDGF beta uh, B fusion that is characteristic of DFSPs that are also treated with this targeted therapy. 
Next up is SMARC-A4 deficient uterine sarcoma, or SDUS. This is also a recently described entity by the Brigham Group, and they occur in primarily in premenopausal women and often present with high stage disease. Morphologically, they consist of sheets of uniformly atypical epithelioric cells with abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm that may be rhabdoid. And they actually resemble the large cell variant of small cell carcinoma of hypercalcemic type in the ovary. You may see some stromal hyalinization in, the, in a subset, and they do have brisk mitotic activity. Other things that you may see infrequently under the scope include a corded or vaguely nested growth pattern, focally myxoid stroma, focal phyloidiform architecture, a biphasic appearance consisting of both small and large cells, as well as spindle cells. <clears throat> Excuse me. The classic feature for these tumors on IAC is they are characterized by negativity. Of course, they do show BRG1 loss, rarely INI1 loss, which goes along with their name as spark a 4 deficient uterine sarcoma. But you also typically see negativity for Claudin4, keratin, EMA, myogenic markers, ERPR, WT1, as well as HMB45. They are MMR retained and P53 is wild type. This of course brings in their main differential diagnosis, which is undifferentiated carcinoma. And in the past, some tumors might have been misclassified as undifferentiated carcinoma as histologically they appear similar and also have a similar amino profile. However, in SDUS, most patients are younger with an average age of 36 years, whereas they're older in undifferentiated carcinoma. Um, Claudin-4, MMR, and TP53 is negative in SDUS, whereas a subset of undifferentiated carcinomas shows some positivity or a TP53 mutation. Um, other mutations besides those in SMART-A4, SMART-B1, are rare in SDUS, whereas in undifferentiated carcinoma, you tend to see mutations common to endometrial carcinoma in general. Copy number variants are seen in about 45% of SDUS. However, only a few number of variants are noted per tumor, whereas in undifferentiated carcinoma, most show copy number variants and have a much higher number of variants. And disease-specific survival is very short for SDUS. The important thing to note is BRG1 and INI1 loss can be seen in a subset of undifferentiated carcinomas as well as SMARC-A4 and SMARC-B1 mutations, so just something to keep in mind. Given that some small cell carcinomas of hypercalcemic type in the ovary have a hereditary basis with rhabdoid tumor predisposition syndrome type two. Um, it was, um, it was uh, the question arose as to whether um, patients with SDUS might also have a heteret hereditary basis. Well, a recent report described a daughter that was diagnosed with small cell carcinoma of hypercalcemic type and a mother that was diagnosed with SDUS. So it does appear that there is a the, the um, opportunity for a hereditary basic basis in these tumors. The role of targeted therapy in um, sweet sniff deficient tumors throughout the body is um, a hot topic in oncology nowadays. Um, although no SDUS have been directly tested in clinical trials with targeted therapy, small cell carcinoma of hypercalcemic type has been um, treated with um, different types of inhibitors, including EZH2, CDK4-6, as well as PDL1 inhibitors. 
So given their response in those uh, in that tumor type, it could be speculated that patients with SDUS might have a favorable response to these inhibitors as well. So rhabdomyosarcomas of the uterus, unfortunately, do not have any targeted therapy that I am aware of. Um, all three types occur, embryonal alveolar and pleomorphic. Um, the fourth type, spindle cell sclerosing rhabdomyosarcoma, hasn't been recognized as a distinct entity in the uterus as it is in the soft tissue, probably just because not enough have been identified thus far. So I'll spend most of my time talking about embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma, um, but briefly wanted to touch on alveolar and pleomorphic. So these tend to occur in older patients. They're quite uncommon. Alveolar look like alveolar anywhere else in the body consisting of nest or alveoli separated by collagenous stroma. You have the small round blue cells and admixture rhabdomyoblasts that are positive for skeletal muscle markers. And these cells adhere to the septa peripherally, but they're non-cohesive centrally. And a subset or the majority um, show fusions, either PAX3 or PAX7 with FOXO1. On the other hand, Pleomorphic rhabdomyosarcoma consists of markedly atypical polygonal spindled and giant cells with breast mitotic activity. It may, it may be difficult to discern the cross striations on H&E &E, um, stain, but you can always throw a skeletal muscle marker on there to prove that it's rhabdomyosarcomatous differenti differentiation as opposed to rhabdoid differentiation if, you're, if you come across that dilemma. The main pitfall for these tumors is you want to make sure to sample them thoroughly to exclude a carcinoma, carcinosarcoma or adenosarcoma with rhabdomyosarcomatous differentiation, as these are um, much more common in the uterus than pleomorphic rhabdomyosarcoma. So embryonal rhabdomyosarcomas occur all throughout the GYN tract. Um, in the vagina, they tend to be in patients less than five um, years old. In the cervix, they're more in adolescents. And in the corpus, they're in patients probably around the age of 40 and older. So grossly, they have the sarcoma botryoides or bunch of greats appearance. And under the microscope, this is what all the polyploid or botryoide projections look like. Most show a cambian layer, which are the small round blue primitive cells that line up underneath the surface epithelium. They are characterized by alternating hyper and hypocellularity, with the hypocellular areas um, being in a mixoedematous stroma. You may see periglandular cupping of the tumor cells around entrapped and the cervical or endometrial glands depending on the location. These glands tend to be very inactive to atrophic as opposed to proliferative or even hyperplastic that you might see in adenosarcoma. Um, of course, the main cell population are these primitive undifferentiated cells that may have either a spindled or ovoid appearance. You may see anaplasia or these markedly atypical cells and at least in the GYN chat, to my knowledge, they have not been associated with any um, uh, prognostic or decrease in prognosis. And also you see rhabdomyoblasts, which are characterized by eccentric nuclei with abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm. Some of the cytoplasm can have these long tails, which are um, colloquial, colloquially known as tadpole or strap cells, and you might be able to see cross striations as you can see in this guy in the center. And of course, they're positive for skeletal muscle markers like MyoD1 or myogenin. So approximately 50% of cervical rhabdo, embryonal rhabdos show, um, show heterologous elements the most common of which is um, cartilage. 
the heterologous elements may be very focal, only seen on one slide and measuring less than a millimeter in size. So it's important to sample thoroughly if you're having trouble coming up with a diagnosis. You can also see neuroectodermal differentiation in these tumors as well as a type of heterologous element. So these tumors were relatively recently identified to be part of the Dicer-1 syndrome. So the Dicer-1 uh, Dicer was found to be the gene involved um, in pleuropulmonary blastoma in 2009. And in 2011, it was found that a number of patients with pleuropulmonary blastoma or other symptoms of Dicer-1 um, had cervical and rhabdosarcoma. Um, so this is a cartoon depicting all the different Dicer-1 lesions. And as you can see, cervical and rhabdo was characterized rel relatively early as an entity in this syndrome, as was their totally late cell tumor, which is the other main GYN manifestation of Dicer-1 syndrome. However, not all Dicer-1 mutations in embrinal rhabdo are germline. You can have somatically derived tumors as well, and these are more common in older patients. And last, at the last USCAP meeting, we presented our findings of um, embrinal rhabdo myosarcomas in the uterine corpus. We had 23 patients, and we found Dicer-1 mutations in over 50% of these patients. We only had germline data um, in three patients, all of which were negative, but given the fact that most of these patients were older and had no um, history of Dicer-1 lesions or family history, we suspect that the majority of these are somatically derived as well. We also no noted that all of our patients, well, all of the tumors that had heterologous differentiation showed Dicer-1 mutations, and a number of the tumors with anaplasia showed TP53 mutations. Other mutations we recognized were those in the PI3K or RAS pathway, and this is typical to what you see in uh, embrinal rhabdo myosarcomas elsewhere in the body. So in general, if you're, you always want to consider embrinal rhabdo myosarcoma in your differential, for lesion, uh, uterine sarcomas in the corpus and cervix. And remember that they occur in all ages, ages, not just in children. Be sure to sample generously to look for cartilage or heterologous elements, since these have a higher rate of being associated with Dicer-1 mutations. Be sure to inquire about personal and family history in all patients. And if the history is suspicious and or the patient is young, um, be sure to recommend molecular testing in uh, to the clinician so to rule out um, Dicer-1 syndrome. So finally, I'll end with uterine tumors resembling ovarian sex core tumor or uterus. These were first described by doctors Clement and Scully in 1976, and they looked at a group of 14 uterine stromal neoplasms with sex core-like elements. They had seven that they classified as group one, which we now know today as endometrial stromal neoplasms with sex cord like elements, and um, seven in group two, which are known as uterus. And these have been molecularly elusive for the past several years, but recently um, fusions in ESR1 and GREB1 have been detected. So morphologically, these tumors are comprised of sex cord like elements. You might see trabeculae or these nested kind of solid tubules that appear somewhat sertoliform. You can also see tubular growth as well as bretiform growth. A corded pattern is typical and can ramify with the smooth muscle fibers of the myometrium. Um, some have this stromal hyalinization. And if you look, the cells rel are relatively non-atypical. Um, they have um, variable amounts of cytoplasm, can either be scanned or more abundant in eosinophilic. Mitoses are infrequent. Um, some of the cells may have a more rhabdoid appearance or a foamy appearance to the cytoplasm. 
and Leydig lake cells have also been described. Uterusks are polyphenotypic in which they variably express sex cord markers, myogenic markers, epithelial markers, hormone receptors, and CD10. However, they lack the JASF1 SUX12 fusion, which is characteristic of endometrial stromal neoplasia, as well as FOXL2 and DICER1 mutations, characteristic of a subset of ovarian sex cord stromal tumors. So it was only in the beginning of 2019 when their molecular um, pathology has finally started to um, become uh, recognized. Two independent groups found fusions in uterus. The first out of MSK showed NCOA2 or NCOA3 fusions, um, and these were with partner genes ESR1 or GREB1, which are both involved in the estrogen pathways. And the French group detected GREB1 and CTNNB1 or beta catenin fusion in a single uterus. And since then, the literature has started to explode with more um, reports of uh, fusions in uterus, and everyone, including myself, have started jumping on that bandwagon. Um, so, briefly, ESR1 rearranged uterus. The partners that have been detected thus far include NCOA2 or NCOA3. These patients tend to be menopausal. Tumors are often um, characterized by a lot of sex cord like elements. You may see foam cells and Leydig like cells, and they're more often to be positive for sex cord markers. And until recently, there haven't been any known recurrences. On the other hand, GREB1 rearranged sarcoma, or GREB1 rearranged uterus. So partners of various genes, and these patients tend to be perimenopausal or postmenopausal. And you may or may not see sex core like elements as well as testicular growth. Um, sex core markers may also be negative as well. And rare tumors have recurred. Given that these do not histologically resemble the typical uterus, one group actually um, dis decided to, re uh, to uh, classify them as GREB1 rearranged sarcomas. So definitely there is a lot of work to be done on this entity to decide if these are all uh, uterus or a different type of tumor altogether. And we recently published a series of three uterus that had extensive rhabdoid differentiation, as you can see from this image. Um, two of our tumors, we had hysterectomy specimen available, and they were uniformly rhabdoid. We didn't see any other cell types. Mitoses were low. However, on the metastasis, they were briskly, or they had brisk mitotic activity. Sex cord markers were only positive for WT1. All, on, all others were negative. Um, the last one, we did not have the hysterectomy specimen available for review, but um, the first metastasis showed that 50% of the cells were rhabdoid and the remainder looked like your typical uterus. And the second recurrence, it was uniformly rhabdoid. This one did show uh, more um, sex card markers that were positive. What was important to note was the time to their first recurrence was a minimum of seven years. So this stresses the importance of long-term follow-up in these patients that are diagnosed with uterus and thus qualifies this tumor as being of uncertain malignant potential. So aside from GREB1 fusions and ESR1, NCOA2 fusions with extensive rhabdoid differentiation, there are a few other features that have been identified uh, to be associated with recurrence. One group looked at 34 cases of uterus, had follow-up in all of them, and nearly one quarter of them were uh, aggressive, and these tumors were more likely to show greater than or equal to two mitoses per 10 high power fields, as well as necrosis. One pitfall I wanted to mention is that ESR1 and COA2 or 3 fusions have been detected in several adenosarcomas, including the NCOA 
two fusion in an adenosarcoma with sex core like elements. And finally, when do we use the diagnosis of undifferentiated uterine sarcoma? In my opinion, I would use it if these three criteria are fulfilled. If there's only minimal expression of Desmond or Caldesmond, or focal SMA expression in isolation, a thorough molecular um, evaluation has been performed, and the tumor lacks the alterations diagnostic of other mesenchymal neoplasms and non-sarcoma diagnoses like undifferentiated carcinoma, melanoma, lymphoma, plasmacytoma, et cetera, have been ruled out. So it's essentially a diagnosis of exclusion. And thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Bennett, for your uh, very extensive discussion on so many different aspects of uterine uh, mesenchymal neoplasms. Uh, I have a few questions that I see online. Uh, one question is, uh, in your paper for IMT, you describe three patterns, diffuse, strong, patchy, and complete loss. Uh, which one has bad prognosis? Is it the last one? It's the complete loss right. of P16 has the bad, pro well, at least in our series, had the bad prognosis. Um, one other paper by Dr. Para Haran, he um, did not find any abnormal P16 patterns in his series of uterine IMTs, um, but a few other papers have noticed that um, there has been a strong and diffuse P16 staining, but it wasn't affili associated with aggressive behavior. Uh, there is another question. So in case of tumors exhibiting melano, uh, myomelanocytic markers, but uh, which lack any molecular characteristics of picoma, so what's the best way to describe them? I would just be descriptive. I mean, the main thing that we're looking for at this point of in time is to rule out a TSC mutation since those have targeted therapy. Um, if they have any other sort of molecular um, uh, alteration that is diagnostic of a different mesenchymal neoplasm, I would uh, allude to that being a possible diagnosis, especially if that alteration has any sort of targeted therapy, because as we all know, standard chemotherapy and radiation are not that effective in treating uterine sarcoma. Uh, here is another question which asks, uh, in case of IMT with pregnancy, is the characteristic feature of immunostain and favorable prognosis are also detected if pregnancy develops in uterus already harboring IMT? I'm, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Uh, I didn't get it exactly. So the question says, in case of IMT with pregnancy, is the characteristic features of immunostain and favorable prognosis are also detected if pregnancy develops in a uterus which already harbors an IMT? I mean, I'm I think sure. it's kind of a chicken uh -huh. versus the egg situation. Like, I mean, you don't know which came first. Did the pregnancy, did, did you actually have the IMT in the uterus before the pregnancy or did it develop in association with the pregnancy? At least according to Dr. Devereaux's paper, all of the um, IMTs that were associated with pregnancy were actually either expelled at the time of delivery or else during um, uh, immediately thereafter in the postpartum period. So I guess if it's released that way, you would think that it was associated with pregnancy and if it and it would have most likely have a favorable prognosis if not if it was there beforehand um i mean i guess you would they would have to have removed it like either a c section or thereafter and if it has alcaminohistochemistry and i would be happy to call it an imt for prognosis i mean you really can't tell for sure i mean the majority of um, inflammatory myofibroblastic blastic tumors have a favorable prognosis, so you would think that it would, but of course not everyone does. So I really don't think that we can make a judgment call at, uh, with this. 
Right. Uh, here's another question. Uh, in the absence of molecular studies, how do you differentiate between UTROSCT and ESS with sex code like elements? So ESS with sex core like elements, um, the sex core like elements should comprise less than 50% of the tumor and you should have the characteristic ESS like features like the um, stromal, like the arterioles and the, just the pattern of stromal cells. Right. So uh, the next question is for fibrosarcoma like tumors, what about CD10 immunostaining as endometrial stromal sarcoma could be a differential diagnosis. Exactly. Uh, if it, some uh, ESS, uh, sorry, uh, like tumors of the of the uterus have shown CD10 expression, and a lot are actually positive for cyclin D1, which can also be seen in um, at least high grade ESSs. So I think in this case, the most important thing is to do molecular testing if it's available to see if you can um, detect an N-TREC fusion, since that would be, of course, able to be targeted with uh, therapy. Uh, one last question here. Uh, any histological clue to differentiate IMT from lyomyoma? Um, well, you should have a lot of myxoid material if it's an IMT. You can have myxoid lyomyomas, but they're extremely rare. And the differential with that is more myxoid lyomyoma versus myxoid lyomyosarcoma, which I believe Dr. Rabin covered somewhat in his presentation earlier in this lecture series. Um, I based a uh, normal lyomyoma should not show alk immunohistochemistry, immunohistochemical positivity either whereas IMT, as long as they're alpha rearranged, should show expression of, IX, of alk IHC. Uh, thank you so much. I think those are the questions that I found online. And for our viewers, if you have more questions, so please feel free to reach out to uh, Dr. Bennett directly and see, give her email at the beginning, or you can uh, write to us so that we can pass on the questions uh, to Dr. Bennett and she would be happy to answer. And uh, thank you again, Dr. Bennett. You would be happy to hear that uh, you had uh, several hundred viewers from so many different countries in the world, including uh, as far as Ethiopia, Bogota, Dhaka, Nigeria, Saudi Arabia, uh, Singapore, uh, UK, Chile, Brunei, to name a few. And there were many viewers from United States and uh, a few from India also joined in. And thanks to all of our viewers for tuning in. And uh, if you like our lectures, so please don't follow to follow our web page, at the website that is pathologicast.com, where all the lectures you can access by subspeciality, and they can also be viewed by the presenter. And uh, please feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel that is Patcast, and also follow and like our Facebook page with the same name. And don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter so that you can stay updated with all the upcoming lectures. And our next Patcast lecture is coming up on September 25th. So that's a little different from regular pathology that we get to hear every day. So we are going to host an oncologist from University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Dr. David Henry will be talking about how pathology diagnosis is making an impact on making their decisions for the patients. And the title of his talk will be Therapeutic Approach to Colorectal Cancer Patient Based on Pathology. So hope to see you then and stay tuned. And thanks so much again, Dr. Bennett, for your excellent presentation. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you.